Hey, online church, Pastor Ed Newton coming from our main campus here in San Antonio, Texas. And wherever you're watching from, know it's our great honor to have you a part of the journey. We're kicking off a new series called The Voice. The number one question that you'll ever be asked outside of, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus, is does God speak? And the answer to that is yes. He speaks in creative ways, and he wants to speak to you today. And today's message is simply an introduction into this chosen voice. And my prayer for you is that you would know that God not only speaks through these supernatural ways, but sometimes he leans in really close and he gently whispers. Until we meet again, much love. As we celebrate what God is doing in 2019, to God be the glory of great things he's done. We're in a small percentage of churches that are debt free, which means that we are moving into the deep water what God has for us. We wanna leverage everything we have for the kingdom of God. Now we're entering into this season of prayer and fasting. We, much like when we talk about tithing our resources, we also wanna tithe our time. So we start off 21 days of prayer and fasting. That is, we're gonna read the Bible together. There's a plan that you can download. We'd love for you to be a part of our Bible reading plan called F260. I'm gonna be doing that. I would love for you to be able to do that. The key on the Lister Guide is an opportunity for you to look at the key verse, the key theme, repent, believe, and observe, and just do what God's telling you to do. All of that information is in the Lister Guide. You can download, you can print off. There's a lot of ways that you could sync up with us. But every Lister Guide, every week, We'll tell you about the scripture that we're reading for the entirety of the year. So we're just saying, God, speak to us through your word. But this season of prayer and fasting is, last year it was a season of God for the harvest, we're praying and fasting. God allowed us to see over 1,200 people put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 1,367 people baptized in Jesus' name. I am not ashamed of Jesus. That is a significant outbreak of God. For those of you that go, okay, what's the percentages of those that were getting baptized? Most churches, by the way, see a high number of children and teenagers get baptized. Most people come to know Jesus under the age of 15. Here's what's crazy about what God's doing at CBC. 65% of the 1,067 people that got baptized were adults, adults. Listen, statistics say that most people give their life to Jesus under the age of 15. So for people to say, I gave my life to Jesus as an adult, it is an act and move of God. And we're just saying, God, thank you for breathing on us. Thank you, God, for the revival. But I believe it's because we're tuning our hearts to God, saying, God, we believe that you could do something significant. We believe you could do something su supernatural. And we believe that you're the God of the increase. We're saying this in 2019, that this is the season of increase. You go, Pastor Ed, like, we, we need more people? Well, we always believe one more. But it's not so much, God, we need you to do more for us. It's actually, God... The year of increase is about me being more surrendered and submitted to you. God, I want you to get more of me in 2019. I want you to get more of me. Come on, can we clap our hands to that? I want you to get more of me in 2019. Now, I'm speaking swiftly because last night at the Saturday at 5, I preached 62 minutes. Sunday at 8.30, I preached 42 minutes. And I, I, I got to get this message today. God's got a word for us, but I need to share this with you, why it's important for us to pray and fast together. I was at our local Chick-fil-A right across from the North Park Mall, grateful for that owner-operator, the Aiken family that's a part of CBC. And I was sitting in there with my son, Lawson. Now, for those of you that don't know this, my son, Lawson, is African-American. My family's like a bag of Skittles. We got a lot of flavor in our family. And when we go out... And not that you need me to clarify this, I'm a white man. He's an African-American young man. So we get stared at, even in 2019. It's unfortunate that we get stared at. But we're at Chick-fil-A, and these two African-American brothers are staring at us. And so I, just in my social awkwardness, I was like, hey, y'all good? Y'all good? I, I don't know why. And they're like, no, man, we're good. I was like, cool. And y'all have a great day. I'm mid-nugget, 
just mid-nugget, look up. They're still staring at us. I was like, hey, y'all okay? Pastor Ed? I was like, yeah. We've been looking at the phone like we Googled you and because like you don't look like Pastor Ed because this is what I was wearing that day. Just, just chilling, just chilling on a day off with my boy Lawson. But I need you to meet Surreal in the washed out jeans and Maxim who I'm holding from Central Africa. Actually, it's a country, Central Africa Republic. They sat down over some waffle fries and told me the story. They said, we sought asylum in the United States in 2008 because a militant religious group burned down our house because we were Christians. Killed my uncle, killed my cousin, and my brothers and my family. We sought asylum. And for those of you that were tracking what was happening at that time, that is our country just chose different pockets to put people throughout the country. And this family ended up in San Antonio. And let me be very clear, no fam they had no family in San Antonio. The government just said, San Antonio. Why San Antonio? They're like, we don't know anybody in San Antonio. We have no connection in San Antonio. They got the Spurs, and that's, that's a good reason to be in San Antonio, but we, we don't know why San Antonio, but we're just grateful to be in a free country. Like, we're grateful to be able to be Jesus followers and not have our house burned down. So we're just grateful, grateful to be in the country. San Antonio, Atlanta, hey, we'll, San Antonio. He said, God sent us to CBC. And he said, I wrote like I'm encouraging you to do, to do today, wrote a prayer request out in the lobby in the interactive, in the 21 days of prayer and fasting, surreal, washed out jeans. Wrote down a prayer request. God, would you give me a job that would allow me to provide for my family? Here's a son trying to provide for his mom, his dad, his brothers. He got some education. Listen to me. At that Chick-fil-A in Jesus' name, he said, I wrote down a prayer request on a wall out there. And he said, I got a phone call because what we do is as a staff throughout the 21 days of prayer and fasting, we take all your requests and we come and pray over them. And he left a phone number and we called and said, we just want you to know we're praying for you. This was a year ago. God answered his prayer. He goes, Pastor Ed, I just need you to know I, I now live in Seattle because I got a job in Seattle. And so I, I'm still connected here. I come back to CBC over the holidays and any chance I get a chance to come home to San Antonio, I come home. But God gave me a job. He answered my prayer. I live in Seattle. I work at Boeing. Boeing. Now, if you don't know what Boeing is, let me just say this. They make airplanes. That's a good job. And he said, God is so good. And I'm just, I'm mid-nugget, waffle fry, diet Dr. Pepper, and I'm just going... I love this church. Like Pastor Drew, listen to me. I said this to you the other day on the phone. I go, I'm in love with this place. I said, Pastor Drew, it's the equivalent of somebody looking at me going, hey, listen, there's another girl that's really beautiful. Like she's, she's a lot more prettier than, than Stephanie. And I'm, I'm like, excuse me, don't, don't, don't even put that in the sentence. Like don't, more beautiful than my wife. If somebody were to walk up to me and go, hey, this woman is more beautiful, more attractive, has it going on a little bit more than your wife, I would look at them and go, dude, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. She's my soulmate. She's my bride. She's my best friend. She's beautiful on the inside and out. I'm madly in love with her. There's nobody but her. And I said, Pastor Drew, listen to me. I said, that's how I feel about CBC. Somebody, because the church is oftentimes synonymously used as the bride. And I'm going, there's a lot of great churches in the world, but I'm telling you, like, I'm in love with the bride of CBC. A lot of great churches, awesome churches. I'm just going, if I worked at Steel City Pops on the south side, I'm driving up here to CBC. If I was at Academy Sports and had a side hustle at Lowe's, 
I'm coming to CBC because there is something going on in this place that does not make sense. And I'm just going, God, it makes sense to you. We just have lived in a day where we just assume that you don't work anymore, that you don't speak anymore. And we believe that we're the continuation of the book of Acts, which, by the way, Acts chapter 28 stops. We just believe we're Acts 29. We're Acts 29, the extension of what God's doing. So I want to ask that you would open your hands today. Come on, let's just open our hands from the top of the mezzanine. I got eyes on you. I'm I'm looking. I don't think I can't see you. I got eyes on you. Yeah, raise that roof. 1999, Bon Jovi. I love it. So hands open. So God, we believe that you got a word for us. We want to walk in truth. The year of increase, God, we receive it as we usher in this new year. Our first time to be together in 2019. God, would you... God, would you do something that history books would write about that somehow, someway, they'll look and go, something happened in 2019 in the city of San Antonio at a Northside church that completely, radically transformed the world. Something happened. God, we believe that you still move you still speak, you still do miracles, and we say yes, our hands are open, our hearts are open, we receive what you want to put into us in 2019, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Come on, church, let's put our hands together, celebrate. Well, if you've got got a Bible, here we go, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to share a message entitled in the voice series called A Chosen Voice. A Chosen Voice. There's a lot of voices you can listen to, but we just want you to know there's only one voice that has to be louder, more significant, more pertinent, and more forming and solid in a world that's shaky and turbulent and unraveling. There's a God that holds things together by his spoken word, and he wants to begin to speak to you. First Kings chapter 19, verse 9, we begin reading together. The word of God says this to us, Therefore he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord. The God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am the one that's left. They seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great wind and a strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire sound of a low or gentle whisper. 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 And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Point number one, if you're taking notes today, I want to speak this into our heart, into our house that we got a God that seeks to speak to you personally. You got a God that seeks to speak to you personally. Now, I get giddy on Sunday mornings. I just need you to know this. I get giddy walking into this place. God, thank you for the privilege, for the distinguished honor to be able to be your mouthpiece, to speak on behalf of you. You're using a frail, weak individual. The struggle is real, 10 o'clock service. I don't jump from one tall building to the next. I'm in the journey with you. I seek to hear God, do what God tells me to do, and speak on behalf of God, which means I walk into this place with eager expectation. God, speak through your servant. Move in this place today. But I need you to know that God speaks to you personally. He spoke to Elijah personally. If God could speak to Moses personally, he could speak to you personally. If God could speak to Mother Mary personally, he could speak to you personally. 
We believe that God still speaks. Now, the Bible, 66 books of the Bible called the canon, it's closed. There's not going to be a 67th book of the Bible. But we believe that God still speaks, and he speaks in mysterious ways. He speaks in supernatural ways. He speaks through circumstances and people and prayer and his spirit and his word. His word reveals to us his character. You're not going to learn anything new about the character of God. God's revealed the fullness of his character through his word. And so for us, what God does is he takes something that he's already procured, the sacred writings, and he chooses to make them applicable and real and relevant in our life. It's what's interesting about this moment that I could share a message like John 3, 16, and we've heard it hundreds of times, but you could hear it in a fresh new way and have it applied, and that's not because of my creativity. That's because of the Holy Spirit of God that takes something and makes it personal to you. God speaks personally. My daughter, London, she's a 10th grader. She said, Dad, like you use these really cool stage designs, and I got a great team. I, I, I don't come up with all the creative pieces around here. But my daughter, London, talking to a friend, said it would be really cool, like if you're doing the series on The Voice, it would be really cool if you had three chairs, like The Voice. I was like, London, that's a brilliant idea. But it's Friday, and church is tomorrow, and we don't have three cool red chairs with buzzers on them like Blake Shelton, Kelly Clarkson, Adam Levine. Like, we, we don't have three chairs. And if you've not seen the voice, how many of you have seen the voice? Would you just raise your hand? If your hand's not raised right now, it's okay that you've not seen this show. It's like in season 27, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay. Just let me summarize it for you. That we judge talent not by what we perceive them as in regard to their stage presence, we just listen to the voice. And then Blake, Kelly, Adam hits the buzzer, and then the chair turns around as to say, we pick you. But as I was thinking through that illustration, God just dropped a message in my mailbox, my, my mailbox today for you to say that there are three chairs on the stage today. You just don't see them. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the chairs are not faced backwards. They're turned towards you, and you have not even walked up on stage yet. You haven't even sung a note yet. You haven't done anything for God yet. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit speaks to you personally as to say, I want to reveal who I am to you so that you can know who you are. See, when you and I know who God is, it defines who we are. And then when we begin to walk that way, we walk in divine destiny, a journey of significance and tremendous ramifications that not only affect those in our circle of influence, but those outside of our circle of influence. God wants to use you to change the world. And so we understand, number one, God speaks personally. Number two, write this down, God speaks practically. God speaks practically. The Bible says this, that God said to Elijah, that is, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. That is, God calls Elijah out of the cave. Now, Pastor Ed, you might be asking, why is Elijah in the cave? I'm so glad you asked that question. He's running for his life because he got a Hallmark card from Jezebel, who was the wife of Ahab, that said, I will kill you by this time tomorrow. So he got a death threat, and he's running He's forsaken his prophetic office. He's quit the ministry. He says, God, just kill me. That is, he's gotten to the, to the darkest place of his life, and symbolically, he's in the cave, and that's exactly how he feels on the inside. He's depressed. He's distressed. He's deserted his office of being prophet and says, God, forget this. I'm done. I'm the only one left, and I ain't going out like that. Just kill me. And God says, come out of the cave, which means that Elijah has to make a choice. Elijah has to have commitment, and he has to crave something better. And he says in that moment, Elijah, come out of the cave. Come out of your depression. Come out of your distress. Come out of your discouragement. Come out of this disappointment that you're facing. I got something I want to say to you. I'm going to allow my glory to pass by. Now, that phrase, 
passed by. I highlighted it in your notes because I'm trying to be very intentional because Moses would have that same kind of moment. Do you remember in Exodus 33, Moses said, show me your glory. And God would reveal his goodness and his name to Moses. But he would have to be standing on the rock, which, by the way, is God whispering to us that the only way that you and I understand the goodness of God The only way we understand the character of God, the only way that we can have a relationship with God is that we stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ. It's symbolically whispering to us as to say, don't gloss over these words. Don't miss this truth. The way that we can be in a relationship with God, a living, breathing, real, relevant relationship with God is through the person of Jesus Christ. Elijah, Elijah, in verse 13, the Bible says, and when he heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle. Now, when we think mantle, if you're like me, because I didn't grow up in church, when I think mantle, I think fireplace. And I think pictures and candles. I, I think of that apparatus that serves as a shelf. Mantle is actually a cloak or a garment. It's not North Face, it's not Columbia, it's not Patagonia, it's not Gore-Tex, it's, it's not like a jacket as we know it. It would more be along the lines of a covering, a shawl, if you will, that he would eventually put on to Elisha. But it would wrap his face as to say, I, I cannot be in the presence of God. Now don't miss this, and I want to try to over-communicate this. God's holy, God's pure, I'm a broken, sinful man. How can I be in your presence? But the one thing that allowed him to be in his presence that covered his face was lambskin. Let me pause for dramatic fashion just to see if anybody's picking up what I'm laying down right now. Lambskin. Just to bring us all onto the same page, because some of you are like, my my friend just over here was like, mm, mm, mm. But I don't know why they're going, mm, mm, mm. So I'm just going to go, mm, 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 because my friend went, but I don't know what I'm, mm, 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 about. John 129, John the Baptist would say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 5 would say, worthy is the Lamb to give glory, honor, wisdom, power, Revelation 12, 11 would say this, that the enemy has been conquered by the blood of the lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, but we have not been redeemed by perishable items such as silver or gold, but the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb. So Jesus symbolically is referred to in this imagery as a lamb. And Elijah has the lamb, that is lambskin, wrapping his face, and it allows us to understand something in 2019 because of Jesus Because of Jesus, the hero of humanity, the hope of heaven, he's the one who wears the belt that's on the cross today as the undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world that allows us, allows us to know that God still speaks. Matter of fact, just to substantiate what I'm saying today, Hebrews 1 would say this, long ago at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Do you know that the word logos is used in reference to Jesus? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you want to know how God's been trying to talk to you? It's Jesus. He's the Logos. That word Logos means words. God is articulating sentences and paragraphs and chapters and books to be able to say to you that if you want to know who I am, look to Jesus. And Jesus would say it the other way. He would say, if you want to know the Father, look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God's speaking to us, and he speaks to us in practical ways. But let me just look to our deaf section for just a moment. And if I could have their attention for just a brief moment. I need all that are deaf just to look at me. When we do a message series about the voice, it's hard for a deaf community to understand the importance of the voice because your whole world 
is silent. But what I'm trying to speak into your heart today is that there's a God that speaks in many different ways. And sometimes he uses words that don't require a voice. It's a story in your heart that he's speaking to that allows you to know that you have a God that knows exactly how to talk to people in different ways. And he makes it individual and makes you feel so important, so special, that even though you can't hear, there's a God that speaks. And sometimes he uses his voice. And sometimes he speaks straight to your heart so you don't require to have to have hearing. And that's the sign that you're receiving it in your heart. We got a God that speaks practically. For example, nearly 3,000 of you in this room, and I'm talking right to a deaf ministry right now, that's not just a side deal of our church, they're part of our church. 70 million people in the world are deaf, 2% of them know Jesus. Listen to me, you want to know why we do what we do? We care about all people. All people. And what we're saying in this moment, for some of you, you're like, this is why I love my pastor, because he can talk to a deaf ministry. Here's what I'm saying to you. This is why we love our God, because he can talk to every person in their own language in a way that they understand. He talks to you in a way that you understand. Come on. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for affirming what I'm saying right now. He speaks practically. Write this down real quickly. God speaks purposefully. He not only speaks through the earthquake, the wind, the fire, but you go, Pastor Ed, in verse 11 and 12, it says that God was not in those things, but don't miss this. When God spoke in the past, he spoke to Moses with a burning bush. God spoke to the nation of Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God spoke to the boys of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Acts chapter 2, God spoke to the first century followers of Jesus that would receive the Spirit through the wind. So what I'm saying to you is this, God does speak loud. Earth, wind, and fire, and I'm not talking about a band. They're, they're amazing, but I, God speaks in creative ways. But I, I need you to hear this today. There was only one burning bush for Moses. See, everybody in the room's looking for a burning bush. But Moses was the only one that got the burning bush. So oftentimes we go, God, I need the burning bush. And God's going, no, I, that was for Moses. Because Moses killed a man and would run from God for 40 years. And God was going to use Moses to lead the nation of Israel out of the bondage of the Egyptians. And oh, by the way, two million people would walk on dry land. So in order to do that, you're going to need a burning bush to confirm that's what you're supposed to be doing. But oftentimes we're like, I'm not going to do what God's telling me to do until I get the burning bush. That was for Moses. So we, we can't extrapolate and go, I need the burning bush. But symbolically we could say God speaks to us in different ways that gets our attention. And we got to begin to see our day-to-day -day circumstances differently. That God may not be in what we thought he was going to be in, but ultimately we know that God in creative, brilliant beautiful, extravagant ways is revealing himself to us. He speaks through creation. He speaks in our conscience. He speaks to your coworker. That song you listen to on the radio. He speaks to that, that tweet or that Instagram image. God speaks in creative ways that makes it feel as if it was tailor-made for you. How can I say that? Because it was tailor-made for you. So God speaks purposely, but God also speaks, point number four, precisely. He speaks precisely. God spoke to Elijah through the gentle whisper. You go, Pastor Ed, the Bible says in, in the English Standard Version, a low whisper. But the word is gentle. Why does God speak to Elijah with a gentle whisper? Let me tell you why. Because when you're about to kill yourself, 
You don't need God to speak loud. You just need God just to press in and just go, I love you. I care for you. I'm compassionate towards you. I've got grace for you. I got mercy for you. And it's not over. God speaks to us loud ways. God will also speak to us in ways that sometimes are not gentle because he's got to rebuke us because we're living in sin. But there are moments where we find ourselves and God just speaks to us through the gentle whisper. But the reason why many times we don't recognize the gentle whisper is because we've not tuned our ear to be able to hear it, which is why we're creating a season of prayer and fasting, saying, God, we want to tune our ear, tune our, tune our heart to receive that message for those of you they might be asking the question, well, Pastor Ed, how do you know sign language? Like, that, that was amazing that you just signed. How, how do you know sign language? Well, both my parents are deaf. I grew up in a silent home. My dad was born with scarlet fever. And so he was deaf from birth. My dad, if he were to stand on stage and speak, you would not understand a single word he, he would say. It was not until I was in middle school, because my dad phonetically would mispronounce things. It wasn't until I was in middle school that I realized that the way that you properly say Home Depot is Home Depot. I was saying Home Depot because that's how my dad said it. Matter of fact, I was in a conversation not too long ago, and a lady looked at me, and she said, when, when I'm talking to you, are, are you looking at my eyes or looking at my lips? And I was like, I, I know this seems really creepy right now, but I'm looking at your lips. She's like, why are you looking at my lips? I go, because my whole life I had to look at my mom and dad's lips to understand what they're saying. Which means that at 43 today, I could still read lips. I was, at, I was speaking at a church not too long ago, and I was sitting on the front row in the, in the choir loft. There were two ladies that were talking, and I was reading their lips. So I walked up on stage and put my Bible down and just said, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Ed Newton. It's an honor to be here. But for the two ladies that were talking in the choir loft, I'm 37. <laughs> they were like, shut up. <laughs> he must be a prophet. No, I can read lips. <laughs> I can read lips. But if my dad were to stand up on his stage and speak, you go, I have no, you'd need an interpreter. But I go, listen, I understand every word he said. You know why? Because I've spent time with him. God speaks. I'm, I'm trying to lay something down for you to pick up right now. God's speaking, but sometimes we don't understand him. And here's the reason why, because we're not spending time with him. Spending time with him. So we got to get to that place of spending time with him. So God speaks precisely, and last but not least, God speaks persistently, persistently, which means frequently. Aren't you grateful for that, by the way? <laughs> we got a God that speaks frequently. 1 Kings 19, verse 13 says this, Behold, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? By the way, if you read this again, 1 Kings 19, you'll actually hear that God repeats this. God said to him the first time, God says it to him the second time. First time he says, God, what are you doing here, Elijah? Second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? What was God saying to Elijah? Elijah was hearing God say, I have something for you. I need you to return to the very place that you quit at. And I'll close with this. When God speaks, he speaks persistently. Here's the reason why, because he's got something for you. God's got something for you. He's got something for you to do, but I need you to not miss this. God's primary focus in your life in spiritual formation is not so much doing something through you, but it's more about God doing something in you. God cares more about doing something in you than he does doing something through you. Because oftentimes if we're not careful, we're all about God use me, and God goes, hey, I'd love to use you, but I want to spend time with you. Because what I have for you to be able to do and what I have for you to be able to say can only happen when you hear the gentle whisper. So I don't want you to get to that place where you're just taking what Pastor Ed said or you read from that latest spiritual formation book that you picked up at the local Christian bookstore. God wants to give you a word that's specific for somebody else that only you can get from God. So God, God wants to give you something that you'll be able to use and share. And you're going, no, no, but that's why you're the pastor, Ed. Like you're the one chosen by God to speak on his behalf. No, God speaks to me. He wants to speak to you. 
God's using me on this platform today, but you have your own platform. God wants to use your platform to speak to someone else, but the only way you could speak to someone else is to allow him to speak to you. And when he speaks to you, you'll be equipped to be able to speak to somebody else. But that requires space. And so today I'll just close with this. A lot of my favorite movies were in the 80s and the 90s. Like one of my favorite movies is about a Jamaican bobsled team called Cool Runnings. Goonies is one of my favorite movies. By the way, I'm not recommending these, all right? So I'm just understand I'm not giving the stamp of approval. Well, Pastor Ed said I can watch Goonies. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you, I typically default into the 80s and 90s. So this movie called Hoosiers. How many of you have seen the movie Hoosiers? But you just, for those of you who have not seen Hoosiers, it's about a Cinderella basketball team, 1951, 52. For those of you that are looking at Converse, like those Chuck Taylors that every, every teenager is wearing right now, those used to be basketball shoes. In 1951, 1952, a group of farm kids from Indiana go on to win the state championship. They beat a powerhouse team. Gene Hackman is the actor playing as Coach Norman Dale. First game of the season, they rally together. All of a sudden, there's a young man named Strap. That was his nickname, Strap, on one knee. He's the religious kid in the movie. Very in tune with God. They break. They're about to run into the tunnel. Strap's down on one knee. Coach Dale goes to another player. Like, how long is he going to be there? The player says, until he gets ready. Now, let me say this in parentheses. Could we live our life before we run out of the tunnel onto the court every day just going, I'm going to sit here and, God, you speak until you tell me I'm ready. Could we just live that way? I'm just speaking this into my own life. 2019, God, I could get up and go to Planet Fitness at 5 a.m., but God, would you give me a discipline to get up and spend time in your word? It's easy for me to go to the gym. God, I'm just being honest. It's easier for me to go to the gym, get my workout on, and begin the day, but God, it's difficult for me to get up and spend time with you. So God, would you give me that want to? I need that want to. I need the want to, God. Now, I'm just, I'm just talking to God. I'm just glad y'all are listening. Thank y'all for entering into the confession booth with me this morning. But that's real. That's the struggle of Ed Newton today. But there's this moment where all of a sudden this team is in the playoffs. The star player, Everett, this is the power forward, gets hurt. Coach Dale says to Strap, Strap, you're in. They rally together. He looks at Strap and says, Strap, listen. Don't shoot the ball unless you're wide open. Break, they all run out. Strap goes to the end of the bench, down on one knee. He's down on one knee, and he's praying. Referee's blowing the whistle. Coach, get your player in the game. Strap's not moving. Coach Dale says, Strap, let's go. Doesn't move. Coach, Coach Dale's just going crazy. Strap, let's go. Doesn't move. Referee's blowing the whistle. Coach, get your player in the game. All of a sudden, Coach Dale puts his arm around Strap, whispers in his ear, and says, God wants you to get on that floor right now. Hops up, scores two winning baskets. They move on to win the state championship. I just need you to know, I don't know what you've done. You may feel as if you've been disqualified. God can't use you. But I'm just so thankful we got a God that does this from heaven. He just puts his arm around you and just says, God wants you to get out on that floor. But I feel unworthy. I feel unqualified. I, I don't feel like I got, I got what it takes. God goes, no, I want you to get out on that floor. And when you hear that voice, you go, if, if he believes in me, then maybe I should believe in myself. If God would take the time to speak to me, then maybe there is something worth living for. I just want to speak into 2019. God's got something for you. He's got something for you. And he wants to say it to you. Come on, let's stand together. Can we clap our hands? Anybody else in the room right now? Come on, can we just believe that God's got something for us? He's got something for us. He speaks. 
He speaks. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And if you don't know Jesus today, would you call on his name? To receive him as Lord and Savior. I prayed this prayer when I was 15 years old, but today could you call on his name? Receive him. Say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. Today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, believing that Jesus Christ can save you from your sin, salvation is here. We celebrate with you today. You cannot be ashamed of that decision. If you gave your life to Jesus today, would you just hold your hand up real tall right where you're at? I'm looking. Oh, my eyes are wide open right now. Anybody else today saying, yes, I gave my life to Jesus. Welcome to the family of God. He spoke to your heart today. He's saying, you're mine. You're loved. You're forgiven. We want to say thank you for watching today's message. We know God's word never returns void, and we'd love to hear from you personally. You can email us at nextsteps at communitybible.com or visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. Here's the reason why. Your story is a story we're sharing, and we are a church that initiates and celebrates life change in Jesus' name. So you share your story, and we'll be faithful to celebrate it. But once more, if you're in the area, we'd love to have you a part of one of our gatherings. But if you're outside the area, it's our strongest encouragement to you to be involved in a Bible-believing church where you can leverage every bit of the giftings and the talents that God's given you for His specific glory, fame, and renown in and through your life. Until we meet again, much love.